Thank you, Dee. Uh, thank you for all the work uh, that you've done putting this uh, panel together, and thank you for the work of the Education Commission. Uh, I've been uh, uh, part of this organization for many, many years, uh, and uh, I just want to applaud uh, the work, particularly the recent work of the Education Commission and all that they've done to uh, bring uh, many different issues and causes uh, and education to working class folks across the country and around the world. My name is uh, Cooper Carraway. I am the current president of the South Dakota Federation of Labor, AFL-CIO, uh, and a member of AFSCME Local 519. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, the Richard L. Trumka Pro Act. Uh, is recently renamed Richard L. Trumka Pro Act uh, after the uh, passing uh, of our uh, beloved brother and comrade Richard Trumka, uh, who uh, uh, passed away uh, not, uh, not long ago. Uh, so uh, for those of you who don't know, the PRO Act is an amalgamation of uh, different pro-labor uh, legislation. So over the past 50 years, uh, the labor movement has attempted uh, to reform the National Labor Relations Act. The National Labor Relations Act uh, is the law that uh, governs uh, um, labor organi organizing uh, and labor employer relations uh, in this country. And over the last 50 years, the labor movement, working class people and the broader movement for democracy have attempted to pass uh, different smaller reforms uh, to the uh, National Labor Relations Act uh, with little success. Um, the uh, PRO Act, P-R-O, Protecting the Right to Organize Act, is an amalgamation of all of the attempted uh, progressive labor reform over the last 50 years uh, put into one large piece of legislation. Some of you may have heard that uh, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders was uh, uh, getting the PRO Act passed through budget reconciliation uh, in his role as chairman of the Senate Budget Committee. Uh, this is true and it is not true at the same time. Uh, he is only able, as uh, chair of the Budget Committee, he is only able to pass uh, the sections of the PRO Act uh, that have to do with the uh, uh, um, Labor Department's ability to fine employers uh, for anti-labor activity. So we'll go through some of the uh, uh, specific sections of the PRO Act now um, and, uh, and uh, the sections of the current labor law uh, that the PRO Act uh, seeks to reform uh, and change. And then we'll get into why you all should care uh, about this uh, piece of legislation and the movement behind it. So right now, uh, under current labor law, employers can drag out a union election process. Uh, and so the uh, 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 union election is the way that workers achieve unionization. Usually the National Labor Relations Board uh, comes down and conducts an election wherein workers vote union yes or union no. Uh, and if a majority vote yes, uh, then the employer is legally uh, obligated to uh, negotiate uh, with the workers collectively. Um, and so at, at this time, uh, the, um, uh, the NORB is, is and will continue to be the principal government agency responsible for enforcing the rights of uh, private sector workers uh, to organize and engage in collective bargaining. Uh, but the current labor law uh, prevents the uh, labor board uh, from doing their job by giving too much power to employers. Uh, those employers are able to use delaying tactics to postpone elections um, while giving them more time to campaign against the union uh, and against the workers. Under the PRO Act, uh, workers, uh, it's the workers themselves and the National Labor Relations Board are the ones who will set the union election procedures. The employer will not be involved uh, in setting the union election procedures. So the employer will not be able to put in these uh, delaying tactics and things like this. Um, under current labor law, employers have free reign to make their employees attend what are called captive audience meetings. Uh, at these captive audience meetings, either the employer or a paid consultant uh, of the employer, a highly paid consultant of the employer, uh, can uh, insist on the employee uh, employees attending uh, uh, mandatory meetings. Uh, so they tell the, the they tell the workers you have to come in at this time, and you have to sit through this hour long, two hour long, sometimes three hour long meeting, uh, where basically the uh, uh, the employer or their uh, uh, hired consultant uh, just gets up and says uh, a lie after lie after lie after lie after half truth after half truth after half truth about the union, the union's intentions, the labor movement in general. Uh, what what will happen if the workers choose to unionize and whatnot. And they can do this as many times as they want to. 
uh, under the PRO Act, uh, the employer will not be able to force workers to attend these sorts of captive audience meetings uh, where they can just lie um, about the union and about the labor movement. Under uh, current law, uh, workers uh, usually are forced to wait months uh, and, and sometimes even years uh, to be reinstated or, or receive back pay after, their be after being unlawfully fired uh, by their employer for joining together uh, with their coworkers to improve their wages and working conditions. Uh, so right now, uh, um, uh, workers uh, uh, are protected under what's called the protected concerted activity, uh, technically by the law. Uh, uh, so if a, if a worker is trying to form a union, talking to their coworkers about uh, unionizing wages, stuff like that, uh, it's technically uh, uh, against the law for an employer to, to uh, retaliate against them or, or fire them or something like that. Uh, but they do it anyway because uh, uh, the law uh, makes workers wait months and months and months or years and years and years before they're uh, ruled to have to be reinstated or receive the back pay from uh, the firing and stuff like that. And by the, by, by the time the workers are reinstated or receive back pay, um, the uh, unionization drive usually is, has died down, especially if it was a, uh, a number of significant leaders that were fired or retaliated against. Um, so, uh, so, so employers are, are constantly violating the, the, their workers' rights uh, the, to talk to their coworkers about unionizing or, or wages or benefits. Uh, under the PRO Act, the PRO Act would require the National Labor Relations Board to go to court and get an injunction uh, against the employer to immediately reinstate the workers if the employer has uh, retaliated against them. Uh, so rather than waiting months and months or years and years, uh, the uh, PRO Act necessitates that the Labor Board goes to court uh, and gets an injunction against further retaliation against the employer and immediately reinstates those workers uh, so they can get back to doing their jobs. Under uh, current labor, labor law, employers who um, violate uh, workers' rights or, or, or any other section of the National Labor Relations Act uh, are facing uh, face no civil penalties. Uh, but under the PRO Act, employers who commit violations uh, of the National Labor Relations Act will face civil penalties and corporate officials can be held personally liable for violation of the law. CEOs, uh, uh, HR managers, whoever's in charge of overseeing these types of activities, uh, they can be held personally uh, liable for their anti-union and anti-working class actions. Uh, currently, under labor law, workers are prohibited uh, from, being, from bringing civil uh, lawsuits against their employer for violating the National Labor Relations Act. They can bring lawsuits against their employer for some other reasons, uh, but they cannot specifically bring lawsuits against the employer or for violating the National Labor Relations Act. So if it's in regards to organizing or, or, or labor struggles or, or uh, uh, terms and conditions of, of work or anything like that, they, they, are, they can't sue their employer. Uh, but the PRO Act will give the workers the right to file civil action against their employer. Current, similarly, uh, currently uh, employers are allowed to force workers to sign arbitration agreements. So these arbitration agreements are usually buried somewhere in this large stack of, of uh, paperwork that, that new hires are given. When, when, a, when a new worker is uh, hired to a new job, you know, we all have to go through uh, a few days or, or a full day of, of just signing paperwork. So they bury what's called arbitration agreements in these uh, large stacks of paperwork. Uh, and in those, in those arbitration agreements, when the worker signs those arbitration agreements, what they're doing is they're waiving their right uh, to collective or class action litigation. Uh, so, uh, for example, what that means is, for example, a, a, a newly hired uh, woman um, uh, worker uh, who, who signs one of these uh, arbitration agreements, whether she realizes what she's signing or not, uh, she's waiving her right. Uh, to uh, engage, uh, to, to then collectively uh, sue the employer with other female workers as part of a class action lawsuit if the employer is engaged in discriminatory uh, or sexist or harassing behavior uh, towards the women workers in that area. Um, and, and that goes for, for any other type of class action lawsuit. The workers will not be able to, are, are not able to engage in um, class action lawsuits against their employer. Under the PRO Act, uh, collective uh, uh, lawsuits and class action waivers, those, arbit those, those, those arbitration agreements, those class action waivers uh, will be illegal. They'll be banned under the PRO Act. So we're, uh, employers will not be able to ask workers to sign them. And even if workers do sign them, uh, they will be unenforceable uh, by law. Uh, so uh, under current labor law, employers uh, oftentimes, uh, particularly in the new 
uh, so-called gig economy, or what many of us in labor call the exploitation economy, uh, employers are, are regularly able to misclassify workers uh, as independent contractors uh, when they're really full-time employees, full-time workers uh, who are working just like everyone else, but they can pick and choose this handful or this section uh, and label them uh, independent contractors. And when they label them independent contractors, what it does is it deprives those workers who have been labeled contractors, it deprives them of their rights uh, that they would have, that they would be guaranteed uh, as employees. And uh, under current labor law, that is not a violation of the Labor Act. That is not a violation of labor law now. That is perfectly legal uh, to uh, take a, a worker and have them work 40, 50, 60 hours a, a week um, and have all the same expectations as you would a, a regular full-time employee. Uh, but because they're labeled as, as an independent contractor, they're, they're not guaranteed the same wage, safety, health uh, um, uh, guarantees uh, that, that labor law provides full-time employees. Um, under the PRO Act, uh, it would make uh, employee misclassification a violation under the National Labor Relations Act, uh, and it would further require employers to follow what's called the ABC test uh, for employee classification. Uh, the ABC test is this very strict uh, legal test uh, for making sure that employees are not misclassified as independent contractors. And I want to say there's a lot of misunderstanding. A lot of folks will say that this will eliminate people's ability to act as independent contractors if they so choose, and it will not. There will still be people who are independent contractors who who, who act as independent contractors. What this uh, the only thing that this section of the PRO Act addresses uh, is when the empl employer themselves misclassify. Uh, workers uh, who are doing the same job and want to be workers and considered employees, full-time employees, part-time employees, whatever. Um, it will prevent them from taking those full-time employee workers uh, who are who are full-time employees in, in deed and in act and in every way except through classification. It will prevent them from classifying them as independent contractors. Uh, people who choose to uh, engage in independent contracting will still be able to do that. Um, under current labor law, uh, multiple employers uh, are able to dictate workers' terms of employment while also evading the collective, bar uh, evading the collective bargaining process with employees. Uh, so uh, a growing problem as, as, as the bosses are, are outsourcing various functions to contractors uh, and subcontractors. Uh, so under this system, each employer is likely to shift responsibility to other employers. Right, and so you have, for example, the the uh, uh, situation with the the, Namis, the Nabisco strike, right? So there's there's a a, um, a strike uh, under Nabisco. Nabisco is also is a company that's owned by Mondelez International, right? And that's that's the case with many of our employers, uh, many bosses around the world. You're not just working for who signs your paycheck. Uh, they're part of a of a national conglomerate, and then uh, that national conglomerate may be part of an international conglomerate. Uh, and it goes up and up and up. And so any, they, can, they can move responsibility back and forth however they so choose. They can move liability back and forth however they so choose. They can move responsibility back and forth however they so choose. Uh, under the PRO Act, it will codify a, a, what's called a joint, uh, uh, joint employer standard, which means that all firms that share control over a worker's terms of employment are considered to be employers of that worker and are thus required to bargain with employees. So they can't shift the responsibility to negotiate uh, with the workers uh, to, to a subsidiary or to uh, a, a conglomerate or anything like that. They can't shift their responsibility. Uh, anyone uh, who's involved, uh, they all share the collective responsibility to bargain with their workers. Uh, further, the PRO Act, uh, under, under current labor law, the uh, states um, have a right to work law. So in the majority of states, 28, 29 states in the, uh, uh, in the country, uh, they have so-called right to work laws. So these, these, these laws seek to undermine unions' ability to collect uh, what's called fair share fees. So uh, in my state, South Dakota is one of the first right to work states, uh, has right to work since 1947. Um, so uh, a lot of folks have a, a, a misunderstanding of what right to work is. Uh, right to work uh, laws do not mean that uh, you're not forced to join a union. Um, that's not what that means. That's, that's covered under federal Taft-Hartley legislation. Uh, uh, right to work, all it means is that uh, 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 the workers and the bosses cannot negotiate uh, uh, for non-members uh, non to pay a fair share fee in the contract. That's all it means. 
uh, and what it leads to, it's an attempt to, uh, it's a cynical attempt to bankrupt labor organizations because then it forces uh, through the um, uh, combining right to work laws along with exclusive representation laws, what it does is it makes it uh, to where uh, uh, the union organizations and labor organizations are forced to do a whole lot of free labor and free work and represent uh, 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 workers who are not uh, participants uh, in the union, the union process and, and do not contribute uh, any sort of fee. Right, so these fair share fees, they, they cover the cost of bargaining, they cover the cost of contract arbitration, they cover the cost of grievance processing, uh, the unions that uh, all the unions are required by law to undertake through the uh, uh, law of the duty of fair representation. You know, on behalf of all uh, uh, members of the collective bargaining unit. Uh, so without fair share fees, uh, union power starts to degrade quickly, uh, which is exactly what they're meant for. Under the PRO Act, states must allow private employers and unions to enter into those fair share agreements. Uh, so the PRO Act would effectively uh, ban all right to work laws in regards to the private sector across the entire country. Uh, further, under current labor law, uh, uh, employers are able to uh, use slick legal maneuverings and litigation to drag out the process of bargaining over a first uh, contract. Um, so a lot of times, even if the workers have uh, worked together and struggled and successfully um, been able to uh, uh, achieve a union and get a recognized union in their workplace, uh, when it comes time to negotiate their first union contract, um, the, the employer will intentionally drag out this process. So it takes a year, two years, you know, a very, very long time uh, before they can even get this, this contract. Uh, the PRO Act would require uh, all employers to follow a process for reaching that first contract agreement uh, when workers organize. And it's a, a process that uses mediation uh, if they can't uh, uh, come to an agreement quickly. And then if necessary, a binding arbitration, uh, which will enable the, uh, the, the, the workers and the bosses to reach a first agreement in a timely manner. So timely, typically within the first year. That's, that's, that's when you want it. If, uh, a uh, contract is taking longer than that, then you know that the, the boss is up to some shady uh, dealings. Um, so right now the um, workers, uh, we see, we've seen kind of an upsurge uh, in uh, recent years, past two, three, four years of workers engaging in their right to strike, right? Or their right to collective action. But uh, these rights are very, like like many rights under, under the uh, uh, bourgeois democratic system, uh, uh, many rights are, are, are carefully curated, carefully restricted. Um, and so there, there's very few just uh, uh, unlimited rights uh, that, that working class people have. Um, so right now there's, there's the right to strike, but it's very limited in scope. Uh, the PRO Act though would uh, currently prohibit uh, employers from uh, uh, permanently replacing striking workers. So right now, yeah, you can go on strike, uh, but the boss can replace you with, with new workers if they so choose. Uh, and uh, the, the PRO Act would prohibit that. Um, right now, the, uh, the, the employer has the right to engage in what are called offensive lockouts. Uh, and so an offensive lockout is when uh, an employer or a boss basically says, you know what, we don't like the way these um, negotiations are going, or we don't like the way that uh, that the uh, that the union's acting. We don't like the way that the workers are acting. Something like that, and they can just lock everybody up um, and lock physically lock the doors of the plant or of the of the workplace. Uh, physically prevent people from coming in the work uh, and say, look, talk to your union, talk to your workers, figure it out, uh, and basically try to starve those workers uh, into submitting to lower wages than they need to. Uh, the PRO Act would prevent that type of behavior. Um, right now, the uh, uh, current labor law prohibits workers from engaging in secondary um, activities. So secondary activities, secondary strike activity, what some folks call, uh, historically sometimes called a sympathy strike, sometimes called a solidarity strike. It's when, so say, you know, I, I work at a plant and that's a national plant uh, or that, that plant has uh, um, uh, other uh, uh, subsidiaries or, or uh, the, the operations of that plant are connected to some other businesses around the country. Um, so say um, me and my fellow workers go on strike at a particular plant, right? And that plant contracts uh, with a logistics or, or a trucking company or something like that. Uh, right now, it would be considered a secondary boycott if in reaction to our strike at our plant, 
you work at that trucking company, if you all decided that you are also going to go on strike against your trucking company for contracting with the plant where we're engaged in a strike, uh, the current uh, labor uh, uh, law would consider that a secondary boycott, a secondary strike, um, and, and that would prohibit that sort of activity. Um, the PRO Act would allow for that. So not only would your the, the trucking company that my plant contracts with uh, be able to go on strike, but if they contract with it or if they contract or do any sort of business dealings with any other companies, you all would be able to go on strike. Uh, anyone who works for anyone who has any dealings with the company that I'm engaged with would all be able to go on strike to uh, apply maximum pressure uh, to the primary target or to that employer uh, so that they are, are, are uh, 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 compelled to come to an agreement uh, with those workers. It would allow, basically would allow working class people uh, more freedom uh, to, uh, to stand in solidarity with each other. Um, so those are the main, uh, main bullet points of the PRO Act. Those are the main things that, that um, they seek to, uh, seeks to change. Um, and each one of these, for the, for the most part, each one of these pieces of legislation uh, uh, each one of these bullet points used to be their own separate pieces of legislation uh, that workers would fight for, um, that have been fighting for for, for decades. Um, and so the, the, the significance of this is that these are all of these pieces of legislation brought into one um, and are being pushed uh, to get passed at the same time when there are democratic uh, majorities in the House and Senate. So why should the people on this call care about the PRO Act? Uh, the point is, is that uh, anything, any piece of legislation, big or small, that uh, allows working class people uh, more room to organize themselves uh, is beneficial uh, to uh, uh, folks of, of the, the philosophy that we share, um, because it's, it's a training ground. A great man once said the labor movement is training ground for revolutionaries, um, and that is absolutely true. Um, the point, the end goal of many people on this call is for the working class to be able to control their own lives, their own destiny, their own resources, their own communities, and to be able to shape the world however they so choose. Uh, and so the, the, the thing is, workers don't, especially workers who have been born into an exploitative system, raised in, in an exploitative system, uh, and lived their whole lives in a system based entirely on the, their exploitation, the exploitation of their coworkers uh, and of their communities and families, those workers do not inherently uh, have the knowledge and ability uh, to run society on their own, to organize society on their own. Uh, so there, there must be room uh, to train working class people uh, on how to organize themselves, how to organize their communities, how to organize their workplaces uh, and, and every function of society. Um, and so anything uh, that, that gives the labor movement more ability to organize more workers uh, that's more workers that are being trained on a day-to-day -day basis on how to run meetings, on how to negotiate contracts, on how these different plants and different industries are run uh, and things like this uh, so that they can more effectively uh, 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 run their own workplaces and, and, and uh, uh, organize themselves in, in a democratic way uh, to have more control over their, uh, over their society. Uh, and so that when one day, uh, when these working class people do inherit the keys of the political and economic system, uh, they will be able uh, and, and be better trained and more able uh, to, to take those keys uh, and, and not only run society uh, as it is now in a caretaker way, but they'll be uh, more, uh, much better trained uh, in how to transform the society. But before you can transform it, you have to know how this society works uh, and you have to know how these different workplaces and industries and, and, and political systems, you have to know how all these things work. And so if you have a piece of legislation like this, which gives the workers far more rights to organize themselves uh, and to take ownership over their workplaces and things like that uh, and, and educates them and gets them involved in the discussion on how these different industries are, are, are working, uh, if they understand how it works, all the little nitty gritty details and things like that, uh, then they'll be much more equipped that when they inherit control and ownership over the political and economic system, uh, then uh, not only will they be able to know how it works, they'll be able to transform it into a way uh, that serves them, their class, their families, and their communities. Thank you. Thank you, Cooper. Thank you. Uh, now we would like to, Cooper, please uh, uh, close your mic. Thank you so much.
and we'll come back to Cooper uh, during the discussion. Uh, but right now, we'd like to turn the mic over to uh, a uh, guest speaker, Angel. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a, a webcam for Angel. Sorry, Angel, I just, okay, there you are. So unfortunately, we don't have an Angel, a, a, a webcam for Angel, but we will be able to hear her. And turning the floor over to Angel, please introduce yourself, Angel. Tell everybody who you are. Hello, everyone. Thank you and good evening. It's always a pleasure to be in in just come solidarity, excuse me here. I'm Angel Wells. I'm the Labor Council lead here in Arizona, and I'm also the Secretary Treasurer of CWA Communications of Amer Communication Workers of America Local 750. So I'm happy to be on this call with brothers and sisters today in the labor movement. Um, I come to you to briefly tell you a little bit about um, someone who I love to remember, who this project, I am honored to say this project is named after, Mr. Richard Trumka, and just the contributions he did for women. I want to say that he was a warrior for labor, and that he's one that we will all miss, especially for women. He was a champion for women's rights, as well as just standing up for workers' rights here, and we definitely lost a true champion there. To combat this at this time, just excuse me, I'm a little tongue tied here because I'm gathering my thoughts on him. So he was such a champion, especially for women. He spoke out against any xenophobia, racism, transphobia, homophobia, sexism. He stated that we needed to fight against sexism and solidarity in the workplace here. We needed to do it rightfully and safely in every workplace. He stood up and made sure that everyone knew that no type of bullying, harassment, or assault would ever be tolerated in our workforce and our labor movement. And that's the the spirit we need to carry forward here. We definitely need to pass this PRO Act. We definitely need better workers' rights. And I'm happy to, to know that this PROAC is named after someone that I admire and I champion. I hope to walk even a milestone in his footsteps. I thank you all so much. Angel, we hope you'll stay with us. And then during the discussion, you can uh, participate in uh, helping to answer uh, any questions that uh, are presented. So thank you so much. And next time we will have you come on so that we can see uh, practice your webcam and, and use it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So now I'd like, so uh, yeah, thank you, Angel. So now I'd like to turn the mic over to our, to someone we've known for years. I'll just leave it at that. Steve, the mic is, is yours. Steve, you have to unmute. Thank you so much, Dee. Um, it's uh, it's really a timely moment to have this class today on the PRO Act and to talk a little bit about uh, Brother um, brother Trumka. Um, you know, I uh, my name is Steve Valencia, uh, and I've been uh, the chair of the local coalition of Jobs with Justice uh, for a long time, um, going on um, 30, 32 years. So we've... Um, We've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of struggle here in this part of the country. This is the southern part of Arizona. Uh, you know, I'm also part of the Salt of the Earth uh, Labor College, um, and um, and on the operating commission uh, operating committee of that school for again another three decades. Um, and also, I wanted to say that uh, over the years. Uh, we have uh, become uh, affiliated, Java Justice is affiliated to the Pima Area Labor Federation, and uh, we actually enjoy a close relationship uh, with the labor movement, and I'm very proud of, of the relationships that we have. I got to say that that's not always um, the way it was. Um, I know that uh, at the very beginnings of Java Justice, it was pretty tough. It was a pretty tough time. Uh, there was some comments made uh, by one of the former leaders of Java Justice, Fred Ascarate, 
who used to say that, you know, people that came out uh, for job of justice uh, within the labor movement were pretty much blacklisted. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really, um, it wasn't really uh, expanded or, or cared for. Uh, and so it was like very difficult in the early days. And uh, in speaking about the early days, um, I think it was in 1987 um, when uh, I was helping to uh, organize the, uh, the pecan workers in Sawadita, Arizona, and uh, along with the steel workers, uh, United Steel Workers of America. And I remember uh, during that time, the, the organizer, uh, Alex Lopez, may he rest in peace, um, was the organizer trying to, trying to get a contract for the pecan workers. And he had a, a button that said jobs with justice. And uh, I said, hey, Alex, uh, what is that? He said, oh, it's kind of a new form, uh, kind of a, uh, some crazy people in a way <laughs> uh, trying, to, trying to make a difference within the labor movement. But that is the very first time I ever saw that back in 1987. And that was actually the year that uh, Job of Justice was founded. Uh, and I just wanted to say just very briefly that uh, in 1987, Job of Justice was founded. Um, and uh, it was in the face of a brutal um, you know, onslaught from Eastern Airlines against the Machinist Union. And uh, it was a big strike in uh, Florida. And it was then where Larry Cohen uh, then was the international president of the uh, Communication Workers of America. Um, and the other unions within the Industrial Union Department of the AFL-CIO said that we need a, a form within uh, the labor movement uh, that can uh, up our, uh, uh, you know, we can hit the streets and where we can do things to try to protect ourselves against the union bashing, the union busting that was put into effect by, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan in, 19, in 1980. And so uh, they said, we cannot do it on our own. The labor movement is very strong. It is pivotal in all these questions of social transformation, but it needs help. And the help has to come from the other sectors of the working class, and it has to be labor and community. And so that was the founding uh, concept uh, in 1987 uh, that brought forward uh, the Job of Justice Coalition. And basically the, uh, the, the coalition of Job of Justice is a, um, a, labor, a labor and community campaign for workers' rights. And so it is very broad. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, I gotta say, it's a, it's a multi-issue, um, you know, coalition. Uh, we try to keep up with uh, all the different movements that are afoot and it's becoming harder. And I'm glad that it's becoming harder uh, to keep up. Um, and so it, uh, we, uh, we uh, became involved, we're actually a part of a larger coalition called the, uh, the Arizona Coalition to End the Filibuster. So Job of Justice is, uh, is part of this. Uh, it's a statewide uh, forum and uh, it's, uh, it was brought together by this, these disparate groups all over the country uh, that we're fighting for everything from Im immigrant rights to climate change to the PRO Act, um, you know, LGBTQ, uh, all of the all of the important uh, um, issues that we have. Everybody is was fighting for these things, and what what folks realize is that there was one big rock in the road, a big obstacle, and that was the filibuster. Uh, a relic of the Jim Crow era, and very much, very much the uh, the point of you know the the racist, uh, you know the deep exploitation of labor, uh, anti democratic, and really in the way of progressing society and for the rights of workers, and so um, we joined this coalition, and uh, here uh, here in a couple of minutes. Uh, in a minute or two, we're going to show a video, uh, and it's a uh, it's a, it's a video 
that shows the uh, uh, one of the efforts uh, made in Phoenix, Arizona, at the offices of Senator Cinema, um, encouraging her to vote against the filibuster for the rights of the people, for democratic rights, voting rights, the PRO Act, a whole list of um, of items that we need in order to proceed. So, um, and uh, before I before I do that, I wanted to just share just a little bit about about the Richard Trumka, um, our, our leader that has passed away. And one of the things that comes up uh, in, in my mind is that he always believed that an injury to one is an injury to all. And so I remember him from the great Pittston strike. And there is a, uh, there is a, there is a video called uh, Holding the Line at Pittston, uh, which is a really beautiful um, campaign of resistance. The other part that uh, I remember is the the California campaign for domestic uh, domestic workers bill of rights, and uh, and Brother Trumpel was there to lend his powerful voice uh, to that movement, as well as you know the many hours and days that he spent fighting for the Affordable Care Act. And uh, one thing too, um, I remember at the early days, you know, Java Justice here in Tucson was formed in June of 1990. And I remember telling everybody how great Java Justice was, uh, the model of organizing and so forth. And uh, so I wound up uh, taking a, a real good friend of ours, Charlie Salas, a steel worker leader. And I took him to an annual Java Justice, you know, meeting in Pittsburgh, in, in Pittsburgh, and it was gonna be uh, really close to uh, the headquarters of the Steelworker Union, so I knew he couldn't resist. So when he went there, the first thing he said was, you know, Steve, I thought you were just jiving me about this movement. And he looked and he thought how beautiful this is with labor and community in coalition together, you know, fighting for the rights of workers. And you know who was there as a keynote speaker? was Richard Trumka himself. And he gave a fiery speech and he was all about uh, linking uh, the various community organizations with labor and, that, uh, and to specifically reach out to these organizations to make sure that we were uh, a very large, broad, you know, um, uh, movement for democracy. And so he was, uh, he was really um, uh, he was really inspiring that day, and I always remember you know him getting up there and doing that. And I think that I think that the uh, the legacy of people like Fred Escarate, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Larry Larry Cohen uh, and uh, and Richard Trumka has uh, laid down the kind of a legacy that's really now being followed. Uh, by uh, Sadita Kupta, who is the executive director of Java Justice, and now uh, Erica Smiley, who leads that coalition. And uh, they brought that model forward. And I just got to say that I am so happy that in the state of Arizona, uh, we have people like Fred, we have Fred Yamashita, uh, we have uh, Trish Muir, uh, we, have, we have the uh, uh, Maricopa uh, Area Labor Federation. Pima Area Labor Federation and a very progressive, you know, vision, uh, visionary kind of a leader in, in Fred Yamashita. And I'm so happy that uh, that the tide changed and uh, and they kind of let loose the democratic forces in the state. And they are well, uh, they are, there's it's like a really well oiled, oiled machine now and so happy for their leadership because it wasn't always it wasn't always that good, I'll tell you that right now. Um, at any rate, I wanted to uh, to show uh, this video, uh, make some noise a little bit, see something different, uh, you know, on the screen. And uh, this is what we do. This is what we uh, link up with. And and this is uh, the reason why we do it is to uh, is to fight against the filibuster and unleash the democratic forces of our working class
to attain good things in this in this life that we have. So I think I'll go ahead and start playing the video and then we can talk some more on the other side of it, okay? So let me see if I can do this. Shouldn't be too, too hard. So here we go, let me know what you think. Okay. Okay. So that was it right there. I'd like to thank uh, Richard Bourne for that fine um, video. And also, I wanted to let you know that uh, the uh, the young uh, sister that spoke a bit ago, uh, Angel Wells, is also in that um, that video, uh, along with uh, other sisters and brothers from the Communication Workers of America, Local 7050, and. Uh, and also uh, she walked with 
um, Yolanda Bejarano, who is a, uh, a, a, a huge leader here in Arizona and part of the political uh, directorship of the, uh, you know, within the district for CWA. So we've known these people for a long time and we're just happy that uh, we're just all together working on this thing. You know, uh, we got involved uh, with the Arizona Coalition uh, to end the filibuster and we were invited by the AFL-CIO. Uh, you know, Veronica Martinez uh, asked us to be a part and we did and um, trying to do the best we can. Uh, let me just say very, very briefly uh, is that we are at a different transition point right now. We're at a crossroads. The idea is, is that uh, we've had so many actions through the labor movement. We've had so many uh, civil disobedience actions, sit-ins, uh, you know, with Reverend Barber, Reverend uh, Jesse Jackson, Barbara uh, Arnwine, and a lot of uh, different, uh, you know, points from the, you know, a lot of actions by the labor movement. And, you know, uh, Senator Sinema has not moved. And so now um, the this uh, Arizona coalition to end the filibuster has been uh, convening meetings on the question of um, what we're going to do and what the, deci the, the decision has been is that uh, we're going to give an ultimatum to Senator uh, Sinema to do the right thing. And, and if she does not, then we will launch a, um, a, uh, a, a, um, a primary, uh, a primary campaign uh, uh, with, uh, yes, with a, uh, you know, with a crowd, uh, crowd pack uh, funding mechanism that would uh, let her know that we mean business. Um, and so that's what, that's what the, that's what the decision is now. We're, we're tired of fooling around. And, uh, you know, September 13th is going to be the, the earliest time in the Senate to vote on this filibuster. So we need to, we need to uh, keep our eyes peeled uh, and, uh, and listen, you know, listen to what's going on. At any rate, uh, it's been a long haul. Uh, we ain't done. Uh, and I'm so happy to be here with uh, Cooper uh, Caraway and uh, Angel Wells. And thank you for the, uh, the Education Commission uh, and uh, Dee Miles. She's been uh, orchestrating this thing and I'm so happy to be here. So I guess that would end my my um, presentation. Thank you, Dee. Okay, on behalf of everyone, I want to thank you all uh, very much. And Angel is still with us, so now we will. So for for Angel and Steve and Cooper, please think about specific things that we can do at our workplace and in our communities to organize in support of the PRO Act and against the filibuster. But now we're going to open the floor to the audience to have them uh, raise any com uh, questions or comments that they'd like to make. So if you'd like to make a, uh, raise a question or introduce a comment, please use your raised hand icon. Now I see a number of you have written comments uh, but uh, there's only one tech person. So if you have a question or a comment, please click, put your mouse cursor on your on the picture of the hand, click it. That will let me know you want to introduce a question or make a comment and we can open up your mic. So please uh, use your raised hand icon. Just put your mouse cursor on the picture of the hand to indicate that you want to speak. All right, Clinton, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. Put your mouse cursor on the picture of the mic and click it. There it is. Hey. Hey, so this is a pretty basic question, but I just wanted to ask, um, what's a good way to start conversations about unionizing with your coworkers? Okay, please write the question down if your memory is poor for whatever reason. And uh, thank you, Clinton. Mm -hmm. And we'll take thank you, Clinton. And we'll take a, uh, more questions or comments. A few more questions or comments. Looking for raised hands. Beth, your mic is open. Put your cursor on your the picture of your mic. Click it, and it will open. 
on your end. Put your clicker, the mouse cursor, on the picture of the mic on your control panel and click it. Got it. There you are. There you are. What's your thinking on the uh, upcoming March on Washington uh, being led by the Poor People's Campaign for Voting Rights? What kind of uh, stake do you think the labor movement has in this, uh, in this particular action? Thank you, Beth. Looking for more raised hands, a few more questions, comments, before we turn the uh, mic back over to our panelists, looking for more raised hands. Janice, your mic is open. Thank you. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Excuse yes. me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Pardon me. Thank you for uh, that was great presentations and video. And I have a couple of questions. Um, so I want to be sure when I'm talking with people that workers will gain further NLRB protections, whether they're in a union or not. Is that correct? Um, if well, with the passage of the PRO Act. And also, um, does anybody know what are some examples of enforcement mechanisms that the NLRB or whatever other relevant authorities would have under the PRO Act? For example, who would stop a company from locking out employees or keep an employer from canceling health benefits during a strike? Things like that. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Janice. Looking for a couple more raised hands. Okay, QQ, your mic is open. Hello, um, I was wondering what uh, the panelists think uh, might go differently this time around compared to 2019. What are we hoping will go in favor of getting the PROACT passed? Thank you, QQ, and maybe one more. Okay, Howard, your mic is open. Put your mouse cursor, there you are. Speak up, please. Me? Howard? Yes. Uh, get closer to your mic and speak up, please. Oh, I'm trying. <laughs> um, I just was uh, curious if uh, the PRO Act will undo the Janus decision by the Supreme Court. Uh, Cooper mentioned, you know, the various right to work states, but um, the Janus decision, in effect, as I understood, makes the whole country right to work. So does the PRO Act, uh, in effect, you know, uh, overturn that? Okay, so thank you, Howard. And uh, so now we'll turn the uh, floor back over to our panelists. So please take uh, two to three minutes to respond to whichever questions you, you, you uh, choose. Remember, we need as much help as you can uh, provide with suggestions as to what we can do in our communities uh, very quickly to help build support for the PRO Act. So let's start uh, with, in, uh, with An uh, Angel. Angel, you put your uh, mouse cursor over, there you are. Uh, put your mouse, yes, there you are. Can yes. you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. So about that first question there, um, what is a good way to start a conversation in the workplace um, amongst to start a union? You always 
well, what we do within my union, we start where we meet everyone on the same playing fields. Workers are normal human beings who come to their jobs for um, a living wage and for insurance and for the things that matter to them. So you start off in normally within like your cafeterias or your lunch sites and everything, and you will hear the needs of some of your workers. And that's how you start to form a union there. You start to see like, hey, um, I'm working extra hours because I'm not paid as much or, hey, I'm, you know, I'm working, but I really need to go to the doctor and I cannot because I can't afford to take a day off from work. So you might need better um, health care or better time off. Those are always things and ways to start that conversation about getting a union. Thank you, Angel. So let's turn the floor over to uh, and and any concluding remarks you'd like to make uh, to at the end. So let's turn the floor over to Cooper. Thank you, uh, Dee. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, Steve. Um, thank you for everyone watching uh, and particularly people who ask questions. So I'll run through a few of these. Um, I think uh, the thoughts on the uh, Poor People's March on DC, I think Steve Valencia will have the best uh, response there. Um, I agree with Angel about how to talk to coworkers. I think that um, uh, uh, you want to start with conditions uh, and shared experience and things like that. Um, very rarely is it effective for someone to go into a workplace and just say union, 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 uh, and expect that to, to catch on or or speaking these kind of abstract ideas of worker power and stuff like that. Really, uh, folks want to hear details, um, wages, benefits, hours, things that are affecting all of them. Um, I'll, I'll say this, uh, a, a key to a, a good metric uh, when it comes to organizing or having organizing conversations is what we call the 80-20 model. Uh, you want to be listening 80% of the time and talking 20% of the time. Um, and so uh, what you want to do is, uh, if you want to find out uh, the things that are, uh, again, too, number one, whatever's impacting you, whatever you don't like in your workplace, probably there's a whole bunch of people who don't like it either. Um, but if you feel like you need to know more, uh, then just ask. Um, and uh, everyone's always willing to vent about their day at work uh, to most anybody who will listen. Um, so you need to find out the conditions uh, that need changed and then move on from there. Um, uh, does the uh, PRO Act uh, apply to all workers? Yes, PRO Act applies to all workers. Uh, currently, the National Labor Relations Act and protected concerted activity uh, already applies to all workers. Uh, we saw this exercise in many places um, for a few years, kind of in the, in the mid 20 teens. Uh, it was kind of a tradition for on Black Friday for Walmart workers to walk out and go on strike. Walmart workers are, of course, not organized. Uh, they're not they're they're not in a union they're not part of a represent uh, um, uh, uh, recognized collective bargaining unit or anything like that um, but uh, they, they went on strike anyway uh, because they were uh, uh, it, in, or they walked out anyway because they were engaged in uh, NLRA protected uh, concerted activity um, and so all sections of the National Labor Relations Act and labor law uh, typically apply to work, all workers union and non-union um, and uh, the PRO Act uh, will, will do the same. Uh, they will apply to uh, workers, all union, non-union. Um, the enforcement mechanisms uh, for the PRO Act are, will be similar uh, to current enforcement mechanisms. Um, so uh, complaints of, of labor law violations will go through the uh, National Labor Relations Board. They'll go through the National uh, Department of Labor, uh, led by Secretary Mahdi Walsh. Uh, it'll uh, um, go through those channels and sometimes held uh, be considered uh, in criminal court, sometimes in civil court. Um, so uh, in much the same way that uh, a violation of child labor law uh, or something like that uh, would be investigated and, and enforced uh, today, uh, violations of the PRO Act and, and other labor law will be um, investigated and enforced and, and using those, those same mechanisms. Um, will, it un will the PRO Act undo Janice? So, uh, a, a misconception, a common misconception about Janus, rightfully so, is that the uh, uh, Janus decision made the entire country a right to work state. Uh, the, the Janus decision did not make the entire country a right to work state. Uh, the, what the Janus decision did was make the entire country uh, right to work in regards to the public sector. Uh, 
Uh, so public sector workers were no longer able to negotiate these fair fair share fees, no matter what state you live in. Uh, but the PRO Act is specific about private sector labor law reform. Um, and so it will uh, eliminate uh, right to work laws that exist in states uh, that prevent private employers um, from engaging in these uh, uh, fair share agreements uh, with unions. Uh, so eliminate uh, right to work for the public sector, I mean, for the private sector. Uh, there is a companion uh, piece of legislation to the PRO Act uh, that will extend the protections guaranteed in the PRO Act uh, to public sector employees as well. Uh, but uh, the Janus decision did not make uh, um, the whole country a right to work state. It only, the Janus decision only applies to people who work for local governments, state governments, uh, uh, things like that. Um, and then uh, what can we do? Okay, so what can we do? I'll say that the uh, 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 number one thing you can do is uh, talk to people in your community, talk to your family, talk to your coworkers uh, about the PRO Act, why it's important. If you don't have a union in your workplace, you need to talk to your coworkers about forming a union, about the conditions that, uh, that are important to them so they can unionize. If you do got a union and you haven't joined for whatever reason, you need to get off your ass and you need to join your union and get involved and then push your union to get involved in the fight for the PRO Act. If you live in a state where your senators already support or co-sponsor the PRO Act, what you need to do is organize events to thank them for supporting and co-sponsoring the PRO Act. Let them know that putting their neck out there a little bit for labor, uh, they're going to get something out of it. That's the only language politicians understand is transactional. Uh, and so it's give and take. So if they do something for us, we got to give them a thank you card, stuff like that. Uh, make them feel good about themselves uh, because that's that's the only way that they, they understand things. Uh, if they have not co-sponsored the PRO Act uh, or, if, uh, uh, or if they've been against the PRO Act, uh, what you need to do is do like our brothers and sisters and comrades in Arizona uh, and put as much community pressure uh, on them as you can. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then, you know, I, I want to say that uh, similar to any type of revolutionary situation, winning, e even if the PRO Act is, is successful, that's only the beginning of the process. Uh, if the PRO Act is passed, that's not, that's, not, that's not the victory in and of itself. The PRO Act is just one step. Okay, so the PRO Act, you get the PRO Act getting passed, what that means is that's more work for us. Uh, and rightfully so. Uh, the PRO Act getting passed means that we have we no longer have any excuse not to unionize every single worker across the country. Uh, we sit back and use uh, the uh, the anti uh, labor laws and, and anti worker laws and horrible exploitation and oppression of the United States and all these things as an excuse why we're not constantly organizing workers across this country every single day. Well, no longer that that'll remove that crutch, remove that excuse, the PRO Act passed, we need to work every day uh, to unionize as many workers as we can uh, so they can stand up and inherit the world that is rightfully theirs. Okay, so now we'll turn the mic to, uh, uh, I wanna say something. Thank you, Cooper, that's good enough to say. Um, uh, Steve, you have the mic. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, um, comment on a couple of these things. I'm one of those guys that have to write down uh, questions, you know. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to, uh, you know, um, to have conversations, for example, uh, with your coworkers, you know, they tell us that in Amazon, you can't even talk to your, your coworkers, uh, you know what I mean? That during the, during the, during the day, because, you know, during the work shift, because uh, everybody is trying to, keep up with robots and everybody is like going 100 miles an hour in there so it's it's very difficult you know uh and then uh, in in break rooms at amazon for example they've got cameras all over the place and they're watching people all the time so um i think that on, on a situation like that um you know in those similar situations we always have to look for a collective in order to uh to uh, you know, tell our uh, tell our brothers and sisters our burdens, and tell them what's going on in the shops. And I think that uh, some of those collectives are organized out of the labor movement. You know, organizing committees out of the labor movement. But uh, in this case over here in in, uh, in Tucson, we've used Jobs with Justice Coalition, and uh, you know we have two uh, two meetings a month, and so we try to be accessible to the community because there's always a lot of things going on uh, that, are, that are hurting workers and it's very unjust and they're violating their rights all the time. Uh, and so we try to keep uh, our door open 
to this kind of thing. So that's that's one way to have a, a discussion. Uh, it may not be directly at, at the at the start uh, with your coworkers, uh, but it's a it's a real good uh, beginning point to uh, to get a strategy on how to reach the other workers. You know, uh, everybody needs guidance, and it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been. You always need the guidance of the collective in order to help you uh, make decisions. You know, a few years ago we had a. Uh, I was asked to come and meet with uh, two women who worked at a domestic, um, it was a domestic violence center. They would help uh, women with their uh, domestic violence issues. So I met with them and they told me that the director of this center was also being abused by the director, which was actually being abused by a high level uh, police, uh, um, a police official uh, in, the, in the police department. And they uh, they were so uh, they were so upset, and so we met. And I says, you know, um, you could we could do something about this, uh, and it would be it would be pretty effective. But uh, they would come back and they would they get you. They come back and there'd be retributions against you. I says, what you need is a union. And, uh, and they said, oh yeah. So it took like two years of meeting every Saturday, um, you know, with at least anywhere from 25 to 30 women. And we talked about all the ins and outs about what the company is gonna do, uh, how you should you know, develop your, your proposals, you know, what to, uh, you know, how the NLRB works um, and, and, and uh, a lot of the pitfalls. So at any rate, there was, uh, there has to be some kind of a collective, you know, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of folks that have already had a lot of experience in trying to organize, and those are the folks that you should you should look for. Uh, let me just plug. I'll plug in Job of Justice real quick and say that uh, Job of Justice in Tucson has expanded to Phoenix, and so we're we're trying to pull together a, a more of an organizational tie with the Phoenix and Tucson sector that we can we can start to. Uh, push out this model of labor community coalition and keep it there so that we can do uh, what what the question is 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 uh, talking about and having a collective being able to talk to uh, to the workers uh, so so this thing about uh, you know that um, that Reverend um, Jesse Jackson and uh, and Reverend uh, Barber and uh, Sister uh, Barbara Arnwine from the Moral Majority, they were here uh, in Tucson and got arrested with uh, 37 other people in front of the cinema's office on the uh, on July 27th. And if there's and if there's time today, it's like a minute and 40 second video about that particular uh, civil disobedience. Um, and uh, but anyway, uh, they have linked up with the uh, efforts here in Arizona. And uh, thank goodness that there's some really dynamic leaders uh, of this Arizona coalition to end the filibuster that made contact with the moral majority and with uh, Reverend Barber and, um, and Jackson. And so I think that that is a beautiful thing to do because this is national now. Everything has become nationalized. You know, our movements have to become larger, bigger, and I, I read a long time ago that real politics starts with millions of people in the street. And I believe it. And that's what we're trying to do and put millions of people in the street in order to uh, change the dynamics in this country to put people before profits. I guess that's okay. it for now. Okay, thank you, Steve. I think uh, I, I, before I try to play the video, I'd like to say that in the paper today, it was reported that uh, both Reverend Jackson and his wife, uh, Jackie Jackson, have been hospitalized for COVID. So we want to uh, send uh, a get well thoughts uh, to them. And thank you to Angel, thank you to Cooper, thank you to Steve. Thank you everyone, please have a good night.